it pains me, it grieves me when some people are coming to orthodoxy and the one thing that becomes the, the, the major stumbling block for them is the saints, our relationship to the saints or the, our blessed mother. It pains me because for me, this was probably the greatest like gift or experience that I had in coming to orthodoxy. It enriched my life with Christ in a way that's almost indescribable. And it, it's just, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's sad when that becomes the thing that people can't get past mm. and what they're missing out on. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is stuff that happened uh, personally um, with St. Raphael. This was told to me by Father Anthony, who you know quite well. And uh, he was the camp director at the time. So this is, this is his, he, he related this to me and he experienced this himself. And this was a long time ago. So if I get a couple details wrong, I think this, but it's generally correct. There was a young person at the camp and I believe they were going through a little bit of a difficult time in their life. And I think they were pretty young and they were there at the camp and they came to Father Anthony and they, they said, oh, I saw this, I saw this man in the woods. And, um, <laughs> Father Anthony was, um, you know, immediately concerned, like who's lurking around in the woods. And he, he interviewed the kid and he's like, what, what did he look like? What did you see? He was very worried about this. And the kid said, well, he was, he was in a black robes and a funny hat. He had a stick and he had something around his chest. These, you know, like the kid didn't know what they were, but you know, the, the icons of the mother of God and Father Anthony's like, it doesn't make any sense. There are no bishops on the property. Absolutely no bishops on the property. And even if there were, why would a bishop be lurking around in the woods? So <laughs> the man had either said something to the kid or waved that in, but he acknowledged him somehow. I don't remember. So Father Anthony didn't know what to do with this. So he just kind of, well, I don't know. And so they were, well, there's a museum there, a really nice museum at Antiochian Village. And in the museum, they have some of the uh, some of Father Raphael, uh, St. Raphael's things, they have his staff, they have a portrait, a picture of him, not just a, an icon, but also a, a photograph and, uh, and, and, and various things of his. So they were giving a tour to the kids in the, in the museum and Father Anthony just happened to be with the same kid as they were walking through and they pass St. Raphael's photograph and the kid just blurts out all of a sudden, that's him, that's the guy I saw in the woods. <laughs> So Father Anthony was just like, ah, this is crazy. <laughs> so um, it's just another story of mm -hmm. like how he, he came to this child who maybe needed something, like he needed some comfort or he needed some assurance. And uh, that was a beautiful thing. So there was a gal that came to our church years ago. She showed up in a wheelchair. She had, she had suffered greatly uh, in many ways in her life uh, to the point that her, her faith had been really shaken and um, somebody brought her and um, just by God's grace, somehow she stuck around, right? And um, we began to develop a relationship and um, she, she began to get interested in orthodoxy and her faith started to come back to life within her, even though she had suffered. I mean, she was a ballerina, she danced, it wasn't she, but she had found herself in a wheelchair inexplicably. And, uh, so her faith started to come alive and she started to really want to become orthodox and she went through catechism and so we were in that process and it was a beautiful thing um and and out of the blue i mean this was just complete sort of nobody would have anticipated anything like this but she uh she tells this story she was in her room and she was just doing some mundane banal thing i don't know what she was doing cleaning or taking care of something and she started being flooded with thoughts like out of nowhere and the thought what was a thought it was a word a single word it was Raphael 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 it just kept coming at her it was just like wouldn't stop and um she she had no idea what this meant or where this was coming from but it was so powerful she couldn't deny something was happening and so she didn't even know who Raphael was. She had no idea about Raphael the Archangel. She didn't grow up with that tradition or anything. She didn't really know about Saint Raphael at that time. Um, she knew that Raphael meant God is my healer. 
And so she was like, hmm, I'm in a wheelchair. I'm suffering greatly. And I keep hearing Raphael. Does God want to heal me? Well, you know, what's going on here? So over the next few days and weeks, she kept having these experiences, just serendipitous experiences where somebody would, she would run into Raphael. And then it's, it was Raphael of Brooklyn, like this St. Raphael of Brooklyn. And she began to sort of realize who he was and get to know him a little bit. And um, for one story, for example, she was, she was wheelchair bound. She couldn't drive. She lived about 45 minutes away from the church. And somebody at church just felt for her one day and said, you know, hey, I'm going to come pick you up. You want to go to mass tonight? We have mass tonight. And I'll come pick you up. And, and so she said, okay. So they went down and picked her up and brought her up to mass. What was the feast of St. Raphael? Just, you know, she didn't know that. Um, so that kind of stuff was happening, all these experiences. Um, she was preparing to be chrismated. And um, she didn't know, like, whose name she should take, who her patron should take. But she sort of suspected that maybe God was trying to tell her something like maybe you need to choose St. Raphael, but she did not like this idea. She was like, no way. I am not taking a man's name and I don't even know who this is. And he doesn't resonate with me. What does he have to do, you know, with me in my life? Um, but she really couldn't, couldn't get away from it. Um, and the name just kept coming up. So she was kind of being hounded, quite frankly. I mean, he chose her, you know, this is St. Raphael choosing her uh, without a shadow of a doubt. So she's still resistant. She's fighting this. Then the Metropolitan comes for a visit to St. Patrick's. And, and we have the service and everything. And afterwards, he's standing up to give a blessing. Everybody comes up to kiss the cross. And he hands them something. And she goes up, she kisses the cross, and he hands her something. It's a little icon of St. Raphael. And she's like, all right. Uh, maybe she's starting to weaken, right, under the pressure. And so she finally comes to me. She never even asked me during all of this, like what I thought. Um, she probably didn't want to know what I thought because uh, she was really being resistant. She, she finally comes to me and uh, tells me all this. And she says, well, you know, what do you think, Father? And I, I didn't say, duh, okay? I, I didn't say that. I just said, you know, it seems to me like you're being pursued uh here <laughs> and i'm not sure what kind of choice you have in the matter and so she she said okay i'm gonna take his name well this young lady is now uh after soon after she she's bounded out of her wheelchair she is back to normal life uh she's married and and it, and, it, and is doing great but this is just an example of how the saints come to us and 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 get involved in our lives and it's a really powerful and beautiful thing um so that's an amazing story yeah, yeah it's a great story L last story uh which just happened last week we had our clergy symposium for the antiochian archdiocese at the village and there were i don't know 300 priests or something there but it was a big group and and we had a great privilege uh of being able to offer western rite vespers on um i think it was thursday night or wednesday night i can't remember but uh wednesday or thursday and that was wednesday i think um at any rate so some of the choir from saint patrick's came up to help us sing the service uh there was about seven or eight of them and um we, we had vespers and it was very beautiful and, and and wonderful and everything and i didn't even think about this but the the saint Raphael's skull and his jawbone were on the altar behind the iconostasis in the chapel uh, they were supposed to be somewhere else, but they hadn't quite had the reliquary prepared, so they left them there. And my the choir, they saw. I didn't. I didn't think to tell them, but they saw the relics kind of over the the royal doors, and they're all huddled around. They're not allowed to go back there, but they're all kind of peering over, and they're like weeping, like they're crying. And some of these people had a real strong connection with the woman I told you about. And they had a real devotion to St. Raphael because of that experience in our church. And they're over there whispering and pointing. And a couple of them are kind of like getting teary eyed. And I look and saw what they were looking at. And once again, Father Anthony, he happened to be standing there. And I said, Father, would you bring those out so they can venerate him? So he, he very kindly did. He went and brought them out and, and put them on a table out front where they could venerate them. And they all just went and genuflected and, 
and 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 kissed the relics and venerated them and they were just so moved they were so touched and um you know affected by being able to do that because they had love for saint Raphael, and then being able to experience this was really was really special for them so those are just a few stories kind of you know personal stories of of saint Raphael. Um, yeah that's amazing this is this is not just a history lesson and it's not just miracles happening in the early church but there's a continuing you know the, the saints are still with us it's pretty cool yeah. I mean that's what matters, right? You know, I mean, I want, I want to, I want to try and like convey that, try and share that with with people, not just like you say, give a history lesson. That's important too, but um, this is the presence of God alive with us uh, mm -hmm. through His saints, and 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 that's so important. And um, you know, we some people might be wondering, you know, like what's the big deal? Uh, why are, why are, why are, why do we venerate relics? Uh, why are these relics important to us? And, you know, they're looking for some maybe theological, you know, defense, some apologia. And you could do that. You can give you can give a theological defense and rationale for it. You can give a scriptural defense and rationale for it. But I, I would start off by answering um, the, the, the question for a very simple reason, but profound. <laughs> the the our, our veneration and, and respect for the relics of the saints in our lives has to do with love, mm -hmm. pure and simple. It's, a, well, it's really about love and it's about power. These two things, love and power. And, um, you know, our regard for one another, my regard for you, you for me, our love for one another, um, both in life and death, not just for the living, but also for those who have died and gone on to to be uh, members of the church triumphant, this regard, it, it, this is it, the manifestation, the expression of our love for Christ. I mean, love God, love your neighbor. The whole law is summed up in this. And the sort of veneration of relics is, is part of a manifestation of that. It, it's sort of how one way that we, it, it, it flows out of us. I mean, you come home, you see your wife, you give her a kiss at the end of the day. You know, you give her a hug. You give expressions of how, of your feelings of love for for people. And I think I think venerating relics is one way that we sort of express this and also recognize that we are all one in Christ. Um, you know, and who is our neighbor, right? I mean, it's not just the guy living next door. It's not just the person in the pew next to us. All mankind is our neighbor, but especially, and the Bible teaches us this, especially those who are of the household of faith. There is a special bond we have with our Christian brothers and sisters. And, um, and Christ teaches us on the, on the eve of his betrayal, he teaches us that it is actually our love for one another that manifests our love for God. You can't love God and not love your brother. And, and we have an indelible, indelible relationship with one another. I mean, it's forged in the fire of the Holy Spirit. It is bonded by the blood of Christ. And this is at the very core of what we understand that makes us a Christian. Um, this relationship we have with all the saints, not just the saints militant, those here still on earth in the body, but also with the saints triumphant who we can no longer see. They're, they're not dead, uh, you know, they're, they're in a different state. They are not dead, they're alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and these bones, so that's the love part, but there's a power part too, <laughs> it goes right along with it. I mean, we know that these bones shall live, right? We know that they shall live. Um, we know that Christ came and he took our flesh and he took our bone and he he sanctified it. He made it holy. He made it a partaker of, of his divine nature when he assumed it to himself. He joined himself to us in this indelible way. And um, so, you know, we also venerate these relics because, of, uh, because we're not Gnostic. That's why. Uh, because Christ is risen. All will be well. Christ is risen. We're not Gnostics. And we proclaim, I mean, at the root of our faith, the proclamation of the gospel and of our faith, we believe in the incarnational reality of our redemption. It's revealed in his body. 
it's revealed in the body of the God man who walked on the streets of Galilee. If he was here in the flesh before us, we would worship him in his flesh. We're not just worshiping his divinity. We're worshiping the person of Jesus Christ, who is consubstantial with us in our humanity. The whole person we worship, right? Not just the divinity, but the whole person. And we, we understand that. We eat his body and blood or we have no part with him. And we also sort of manifest this love through our love for the saints who've been glorified.